Next, we look at the opioid epidemic in the United States as the country reached 100,000 drug overdose deaths in the most recent 12-month period. Those demanding accountability have rallied outside the Department of Justice. One of them was Ed Bish. Since losing his son to an OxyContin overdose in 2001, he's turned to activism and founded Relatives Against Purdue Pharma. That's the maker of the addictive painkiller, which was owned by the Sackler family. He's been speaking with Hari Srinivasan about this campaign, alongside the author of Dope Sick, Beth Macy. Christian, thanks. Ed Bish, Beth Macy, thank you both for joining us. Uh, Beth Macy, you have chronicled this national tragedy in the book Dope Sick and now Dope Sick on Hulu and other places. And, you know, here is a father in his grief like Ed, like so many other parents and family members throughout the country that you've spoken with who have been impacted so personally and tragically by this epidemic. And Give us a, some perspective here. You know, the rally on Friday, we had two former federal prosecutors. When, when's the last time you've seen federal prosecutors uh, protest at a rally in front of the Department of Justice? You had Paul Peltier, uh, the former head of the fraud unit. You have Rick Matt, Mountcastle. He's, he's the person who's portrayed in the Hulu series. He spent five years of his life. He wrote that 120 page memo. And, you know, just we just reached the threshold of 100,000 deaths annually a few weeks past, right? And um, Ed gathered us all for the, for the, for the rally on Friday. Uh, we all stayed in the same hotel. And, and that morning, uh, the janitor was uh, saying, hey, what are you all here for? And uh, when somebody told him, he burst into tears because he had lost two relatives 18 years ago to OxyContin. And think about that. These are, what crime can you name in the nation that has killed more people and has left uh, fewer families uh, touched? We now have a third of American families have experienced uh, uh, opioid addiction and the overdose crisis. And like, what more evidence is it gonna take? It's just so frustrating that we seem to have one justice system for, you know, the guy who used to work with that subway who's still in jail because he sold some weed uh, and billionaires who, recidivist billionaires, by the way, the company pled guilty in 07, pled guilty again in 2020, and then they slid in through the bankruptcy or in the process of sliding through on a loophole uh, to get away a third time. And it's when you see these families that have been like Ed, Ed was leading the charge at the, at the front of the rally in 2207, right? With a photo of his son, Ed. To, on Friday, he had the same exact photo and it now has yellow tape on it. And um, I just think uh, it's time for America to listen to them. Ed, when people look at the headlines in the past few weeks, they're going to say, oh, well, the looks like there's a big settlement that, you know, the victims are going to be compensated. So why is that not enough for you? <clears throat> well, the headlines are wrong. They're very misleading. Number one, this is under appeal, so it's not a done deal. Number two, the victims are getting less than the lawyers the victim's average payout will be $5,000, okay? Not I'm enough to cover, cover funeral expenses. The, the top payout is 48,000 minus your lawyer fees and expenses. And very few people are going to get that. So like I said, the average payout, $5,000, it's, 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 it's a sad joke, it really is. I've called that a bankruptcy scam from day one. And the, the whole point of it was to give the Sacklers immunity. But well, as more and more people, and they make it confusing on purpose, but as more and more people are learning what it's all about, and it seems like this appeal judge realizes what it's really about, and hopefully she makes the correct decision. And they, they have made a mockery of the U.S. justice system. Now they're making a mockery of the U.S. bankruptcy system so much that there's two separate bills in Congress 
which unfortunately is to, are too late to stop them, but inspired by their uh, misdeeds. Beth Macy, uh, these flaws that he's talking about that are structural, both in the bankruptcy system and the justice system, what led to this situation where we have the heads of these companies or this family are able to walk away so far without any personal liability? Is it that they, as a company, have paid large amounts, whether it's to lawyers or whether it's to victims? Is it, I mean, you know, oftentimes in white collar crimes, we, we get to hear that phrase, uh, they will do so without admitting any wrongdoing. But in these cases, as you pointed out, there have been losses that the company has had to admit to. Yeah, okay, so they have agreed to pay four and a half billion and give up the keys to the company in exchange for full civil immunity. Um, but right before they filed for bankruptcy, they strategically drained more than 10 billion. And if you take that four and a half that they're supposed to be gonna pay over nine years and figure in investments, they're gonna walk away um, from the settlement, if it, if it goes as is, as wealthy as they are right now. And, and that's why Ed and all the other families of the dead are, are so upset about this. Ed, I want to ask a little bit about your son and what prompted you to become so fervent in trying to gather information and becoming uh, an advocate for other victims of opioids. My son died in February of 2001. The very first time I heard the word Oxycontin, my son was laying in his bed dead from it. The first time I heard the word. So I started educating myself. And as I learned more and more, and as the deaths grew more and more, I started a website just to warn kids about that, you know, don't, mess with Oxycontin and it'll kill you. Well, through this website, I started getting emails from parents all over the country. And as we learned more and more how this company was lying, like saying less than 1% of patients get addicted and they were propping up pain orgs. As I learned that parents would say, what can we do? What can we do? So we decided to do a protest in 2003 in Orlando, F Florida, at one of their uh, lavish doctor seminars. And they said, well, what are we going to call, call ourselves? And we came up with RAPP, R-A-P-P, -P, Relatives Against Purdue Pharma. And now today, there's thousands and thousands of us, because anyone who ever stood up to P Purdue Pharma Whoever spoke out, they're a member of RAT. And I was proud we had close to 200 of them there at the rally on Friday. And it, it was a moving ceremony. You know, Beth, one of the things that Ed mentioned, which stuck out to me, is uh, you know, there's that phrase, less than 1% of people get addicted. And when you watch the Dopesick on Hulu or you read your book, you find the kind of origin story of where that statistic came from. And then there's just almost an, an entire lexicon of vocabulary, phrases of pseudo addiction. All this comes down to sort of messaging and marketing and a skillful way, uh, again, uh, separate from the outcome, but it was unbelievable how systematic it was that we in America have changed the conversation around pain partly due to the interests of more sales of a specific drug. Right, it was, it was Arthur Sackler marketing 101. You know, he is the uncle of Richard Sackler and he turned Valium into, you know, mother, Mother's Little Helper, the first billion dollar drug in American history. And Arthur and his uh, relatives and cohorts used those techniques to flip the narrative. For a hundred years, we had a huge opioid crisis after the Civil War, right? Morphine, doctors would just leave morphine and syringes with people and say, use as needed. Well, after that became a huge epidemic, we, we the, the government really cracked down. What 
Richard Sackler managed to do using his uncle's marketing strategies was to flip the narrative to say, you know, Oxycontin is safe in all you know, less than 1% of cases. And they just diabolically um, t uh, targeted these communities and the most neglected people in America and the most vulnerable people. And, by, and then they stigmatized them um, and blamed them for the addictions that, that they were partially responsible for. Um, we, we've got to get over this idea that all drug users are bad, that, um, that I, mean, I mean, it was so moving to be with all those families on Friday because people would come up and they say, we saw your show, we read your book, and all of a sudden, I understand what my son went through. My son's dead, but now I finally understand. These people desperately want to get better. It's just, they need help, and we're not providing that help at the scale to match the scale of the epidemic. So, Ed, um, from the rally this last week, was there something new for you? Yeah, yeah. So during the rally, I got an email from our pro bono lawyer, Michael Quinn, of the Ad Hoc Committee of Accountability, saying that the DOJ, DOJ has reached out to him, and they have read our letter that we sent, and he is trying to set up a meeting for this week where we get to voice our concerns. And, you know, it's a start. It's further than we've gotten before. Do you have a specific ask for them, exactly what it is that you want them to do? The DOJ has enough evidence to prosecute. And that's what we're asking. Review the evidence. Do your job. Beth, what do you think the likelihood is of Ed's wish here? So so I'm a little hopeful. Um, but but should we should should ed here have to be making noise now for more years than his son who was 18 when he passed was actually alive i mean this man has been through it um and i, I was also really buoyed friday by the fact that you know we had two career prosecutors you know including one who used to work at the doj the evidence is all there it's all beautifully laid out before them um we just need uh, we need people to have some courage uh, so that there aren't two forms of justice, one for billionaires and one for all the rest of us. I mean, besides um, the, the case that's been made in the court of public opinion, I mean, we had recently uh, the attorney general of Massachusetts saying that there from what she's seen, she's publicly asked that the DOJ should bring charges against the Sacklers. Do you think that's likely to happen, Beth? I don't want to. I don't want to count this group out, man. I would not want to go against Ed Bish. He's not giving up. Nan Golden's not giving up. Uh, nor are uh, you know the 300 parents we had out there on Friday, and um, they're doing what's right. Uh, the D D Justice Department's job is to make sure the law has been followed. Purdue Pharma is recidivist criminals. They have uh, been found guilty in 07, again in 2020, and now they're skating out of, uh, through some loophole, uh, the bankruptcy, and they're gonna come out richer than they were. And that is just not right. It's so simple if you just lay out the facts and look at them. Beth Macy, Ed Bish, thank you both for joining us. Thank you so much, Hari. And we reached out to the Department of Justice and they said, quote, as a general matter, the department does not confirm, deny, or otherwise comment on the existence or non-existence of investigations, criminal, civil, or otherwise. We decline to comment further. We also reached out to attorneys for the Sackler family and we've not received a response. Last year, Purdue Pharma pleaded guilty to three felony offenses, saying the company is taking responsibility for past misconduct. In a court filing, a lawyer for the family says there is no evidence to support the idea that the Sacklers abuse the bankruptcy system. The Sackler family has apologized for OxyContin's role in the opioid epidemic and the suffering caused. No criminal charges have ever been filed against the Sacklers.